Milling Through History presents Mail Order Murder. When we think about serial killers, we think mostly that this is an area dominated by men. And we're right. Most serial killers tend to be men. However, historians have begun to acknowledge that perhaps some of the most notorious serial killers from the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century might not have been them, but rather women. Women would oftentimes just fly under the radar because nobody during these time periods ever thought women could have potentially committed such gruesome murders. And yet, history has now shown that it was possible. And perhaps one of the most gruesome serial killers that the world never really knew much about was a woman by the name of Bell Gunnis. Born Brynhild Storth on November 11, 1859 in Selbu, Norway, this is a young girl who would grow up having the great American dream of going from poverty in Europe and trying to make something of herself in America. And at the age of 22, she would earn enough money to move to the United States. In 1881, she arrived at Castle Garden to be processed for immigration and changed her first name to Bell, being much easier to pronounce. From there, she would move to Chicago, where she took work as a domestic servant and eventually at a butcher shop. She was described by those contemporaries who knew her as five foot seven in height and weighed anywhere between 210 and 250 pounds. Accounts also stated that she was physically strong and looked rather masculine. In 1884, she would marry Mad Sorensen, and during her marriage, both she and her su husband suffered several tragedies. First, their candy shop and home both burned down mysteriously. In addition to this, Sorensen's two children died from an inflammation of the large intestines. What made these circumstances rather peculiar, though, was that the buildings and the children had large insurance policies placed upon them. But if this seemed like rather a unique case of, well, aren't you glad you had that? On July 30th, 1900, Sorensen himself would pass away from a cerebral hemorrhage. Now, his death also came under scrutiny because he had two insurance policies on his life and both were in effect on July 30th. One policy was set to expire on that date, while the other policy went into effect, a new one that he had gotten for himself. As such, if he died on July 30th, the beneficiary, this being his wife, would receive a massive payday, and that's exactly what happened. Bell would receive $5,000 in life insurance, and she would take this money, leave Chicago, and move off to LaPorte, Indiana, to live on a pig farm. Now, once in Indiana, she set up a home for herself, and she would be putting out ads in Norwegian newspapers, being read specifically only by the Norwegian community, stating that she was looking for a husband. And newly arrived immigrant men from Norway would come answering her call. On April 1st, 1902, she would marry Peter Gunnis, and within nine months, both her husband and his daughter had died. According to Bell, a meat grinder had fallen from a shelf and smashed his skull. Once more, she would collect a life insurance policy on her second husband of $3,000. Even though a coroner's jury was convened, Bell was not charged with murder. Now, once more, she dipped into the well and put out ads for husbands, and a number of men would come answering her letters. They would arrive in Laporte, come live with her. After a few weeks, they would set up a life insurance policy and then suddenly, just as soon as they arrived, disappear. She would say they went off to live or move to work somewhere else. And then she would never hear from them again. And so this process would continue on for six years. On April the 28th, 1908, the home of Bill Gunness would erupt into flames in the middle of the night. As neighbors came running out to extinguish the flames, Gunness was reported to have exited the house and then returned inside to save her adopted children. When the structure collapsed, the burned remains of a headless female body and three children were found. As efforts were made to try to determine how the fire began, it was discovered soft, there were soft depressions throughout the entire property, first in what was the basement and then over toward the pig stalls. 
The investigation continued, and when the depressions were dug up, it was discovered bodies were inside them, surrounded by limestone. After a while, the police would begin to stop counting the bodies being found because there were just too many there. A former hired hand would confess that Belle would lure men into her home, kill them, and take their money or whatever supplies they brought uh, and, and use it for her own personal gain. He also claimed that she faked her death. Always wary of the fact that one day she would be caught, she had killed a woman, decapitated her, and kept the body in the basement. This way, the fire could be set, and thus, she could get away with it. Now, doctors had acknowledged that while the body found in the fire that was headless was smaller than Gunness, flames were notoriously known for shrinking the body, and therefore, it could have been her. But it did not explain why there was a certain lack of a head. Now, newspapers would continue to report that, Gil Gun that Bell Gunness had survived the fire and was spotted throughout the region of Indiana and Illinois, going well towards after the First World War. Now, whether or not this notorious serial killer survived the fire is up for debate. And yet, the gruesomeness of her murders and the fact that she got away with it so well proved that most people, when looking for a serial killer, automatically made their own assumptions and would end up leaving evidence behind that pointed towards her. And so, she could get away with this and never be worried about getting caught until one fateful night. For more information please consider these suggested titles. Be sure to click on the left-hand side of the screen to subscribe to our show, and on the right-hand side for our latest episode. And we will see you again for the next episode of Milling Through History. <laughs>